So validity is the ability of a test to give us information that we can make meaningful, appropriate, and useful decisions based upon that information. How well-founded, trustworthy, and reliable is the content? So here we have, you know, Robert De Niro and Ben Stiller. Robert De Niro is doing a, a lie detector test to Ben Stiller to make sure he's good, has good intentions with uh, Robert De Niro's daughter in the movie. And uh, Ben Stiller is very, very nervous. Okay. A lie detector test. You see a lie detector test. Those of you who have time to watch afternoon TV on shows like Jerry Springer. And they use a lie detector test. Are you having an affair with la la la? Okay. Did you have an affair? All that fun stuff. So the lie detector test actually is highly valid. It actually can tell you whether someone's lying or not with a high degree of accuracy. The only problem with lie detector tests, if you are a career criminal, and any of you listening who is a career criminal will know this, you can actually make the lie detector, detector, <laughs> lie detector results invalid. You can monitor your breathing and control your blood pressure, just like a Tibetan monk might do, but you do it. So when they say, did you commit this crime? You can say no, and will come up as no. So in fact, a lie detector test is highly valid for people who are not career criminals, but those who are able to figure it out, it's not valid. The other problem is, and from a lawyer perspective, if you use a lie detector test in a court of law and you go up to a jury and you say in a criminal case, um, this person came up as over 99%, we're 99% sure this person, when they said they uh, did not commit the crime, were lying, based on the lie detector test, it's too probative. People are going to believe it too much. And so you actually have prohibition event against self-incrimination. That's another reason why you don't use it in courts. But afternoon TV, it's a pretty good test. One of the most important features of validity is construct validity. That is, how well does the test measure what it was meant to measure? So when we go back to the cricket, her test was not measuring the cricket's ability to hear. Her test was measuring how hard it is to jump when you don't have legs, right? And so when we think about our test, construct validity says, are we actually identifying a person with a disability is having a disability. We think of construct validity as the keystone of normal test development. And you see in this arch above that little heating unit, the keystone is that triangle-shaped stone that holds the arch up. Construct validity holds the entire construct of assessment up. If there's no keystone, the, it all falls apart. So let's see how we think about construct validity when we're thinking about assessment. Well, in both psychology and speech language pathology, we have the same standard. When we're thinking about construct validity, okay, how well does the test do what it's meant to do? When we're doing our assessment tests, we want a test that accurately identifies children with disabilities from children who are typically developing. That would be a test with good validity, construct validity. Okay, so in both speech pathology and, audio and psychology, the standard is the same. If you're 80 to 89% accurate, it's fair. And if you're 90 to 100% accurate, it's good accuracy. So imagine you're giving the test to 100 children, and let's say 200 children, 100 of them we know have a disability. So we've gotten the test. We're going to see how good its construct validity is. The test has already been created. Now we're going to take it and we're going to give it to children with disabilities. 100 kids with disabilities that we've gotten. It's usually not even as big a number as 100. But just say, make it easier for me math-wise, 100. And we give this test to 100 kids. And guess what? It accurately identifies 80 of them. 20 of them aren't identified as having a disability. That's fair. That meets our standard. Now let's go over to our typically developing kids over here. Again, we get the test from the test publisher. We're the test publisher trying to find out construct validity. We bring it over. We give the test to all our typically developing kids. Guess what? Those kids, 100 of them, 20 of them, again, they are identified as having a disability when they don't have one. 
But still, according to our standards, that's fair, that passes. Anything under 80% is considered unacceptable and can have serious social consequences. I actually think you have serious social consequences with those 20 kids that are identified as typically developing in this group and the 20 kids that are identified as having a disability when they don't in that group. But it's not my thing. We try to think, we try to pretend that our tests are like sorting hats in the Harry Potter movie. So we take the sorting hat and we put it on a child, well, put it on a child's head and that hat will say, this one has a disability. And then we put on another child, this child is a Gryffindor, they don't have a disability, right? We don't have a test like, we don't have a sorting hat. Likely we will not get one for a very, very long time. I will probably be, be uh, pushing up daisies before we ever get a test like that. So here we have no sorting hat. So we have, we're kind of, how do we make sure that we're accurate? Now let me just ask you a question, just a little on the side. What would you do if you were a test manufacturer and you wanted to have very good validity? So here we go, I got my test. I'm bringing it over. I'm gonna give it to this group of 100, but who are this group of 100? Let's say I get this group of 100. It's a language test. Let's say I get this group of 100. Not only do they have a language disorder, I know. They also have, they're on the spectrum, and they have cognitive displays. When I give my test, it's gonna raise the accuracy of that test because the kids have more severe disabilities. It's much harder when you have a mild to moderate delay or only a language delay or a mild to moderate cognitive delay to give a test that's gonna have good, what this is called sensitivity, the ability to identify kids with disabilities as having a disability. Now, what about our typically developing group? What I'm talking about now is called spectrum bias. Our typically developing group, hmm, let's see. Well, I'm not going to get them from East Harlem. I'm not going to get them from East New York. I'm going to get them from, I'm going to go out to Rye, New York. I'll go out to Rye and I'll go out and get a bunch of kids who go to the Rye Public Schools very high socioeconomic background, parents are highly educated. Let me see how my test does. So my typically developing kids, I give it to them. Boy, we have really good specificity. The typically developing children are identified as typically developing on this test, fantastic. But the issue here is, were the kids who had a disability the ones that you really have to worry about? Because the truth is, with those kids who are on the spectrum of very severe disabilities, more than one standard deviation below the mean, you don't need a speech pathologist or a psychologist or a special ed evaluator. You just seen my niece, Edie, who's nine years old, and you bring her into a room with a bunch of kids like that and a bunch of typically developing kids, leave her there for 20 minutes, she'll separate them out. The issue is the kids who have a mild to moderate disorder, those are the ones where you need the expertise of a high level evaluator. The tests aren't gonna do it. Okay, so hopefully one day we will have a sorting hat. We don't know, but we've been pretending like we did. Okay, let's look at the PLS for Spanish. It is an adapted, not translated version. Remember I mentioned that. If you look at specificity, now this is not something that's hard to find. If you read the examiner's manual on page 216 to 222, this is where this information is from. It's not from some like, cobweb infested, you know, back bookshelves of the Columbia University Library. It's right in the test manual that you bought. And what it says, specificity is only 55, 57, 63, depending on the age, percent accurate. Meaning the ability of that test to identify typically developing children as typically developing is about as accurate as a coin toss. You want heads or tails? Now, when you say why, well, when you look at it, they mentioned something about these kids were from lower income backgrounds. Let me tell you, when I'm assessing kids, I don't want to test that's only good if the kids are from high income backgrounds. I want a test that will help me with the kids from lower income backgrounds to help me make that determination. Right now, there are no tests that are going to do that, just so you know. But you've got to look at your test to know that even this the PLS for Spanish, and it's well developed. It's got a, a, probably the best developed in many ways of any preschool language test. The construct validity isn't there. How many kids 
have speech pathologists identify, or psychologists or educational evaluators identified as having a disability based on a test with that little bit of accuracy. Now the real three is another test that people started using. And now it's mostly an EI test, early intervention test, but there's a lot of kids turning three that they can still use the real three for. You just have to look at your test manual. The, the PLS has a big test manual. The real has a very small one. And if you turn to page 40, table 6.6 .6 of the real three, you will see the means for children. Now let's just start. One of my favorite things is, I'm going to turn there, is the bell curve. My favorite shape. My students make fun of me. It is my favorite shape. So if you look at the bell curve and you look at the mean, what score would you accept if you were, expect if you were at the mean? The score would be 100, right? And what percentage of the population would be above you and below you if you're at the mean? 50% above and 50% below. Average is considered anywhere from a standard score of 85, which is one standard deviation below the mean, to a standard score of 115, one standard deviation above the mean. Let's go back and look at the PLS, the real three. That table, page 40, table 6.6, .6, actually gives you the mean for the sensitivity group, meaning the kids with disabilities in their construct validity studies. And it tells us that the mean for children who had a receptive language impairment, the mean was 93. The mean for children with an expressive language impairment was 84, standard score of 84, and the mean for the composite was 86. So let's have a look at the bell curve. Well, a 93 falls very close to 100 and is within the means, within average. At 84 is one standard score outside of the average, so they wouldn't find that as having a disability. And at 86, which was your composite language score, it's within one standard deviation below the mean. So actually, the real three has no diagnostic accuracy no construct validity. And anybody who uses that test has to know that from looking at page 40, table 6.6.